Welcome to another episode of Thursday's Lessons. I am Thursday. And I am Varmint. And this is a show where we draw lessons from various sources such as history, culture, nerdiness, anything that can give us lessons. Today we're continuing from our last show where we talked about the shows Avatar The Last Airbender and Legend of Korra. And we talked about the sort of interconnectedness of the characters, lessons of friendship and power and, you know, how people are both good and bad. There was a lot of lessons in there. But for this show, we're going to talk about one specific character because I think... This guy's the linchpin of the lessons of everything. I avoided him in the last show, specifically for the reason of doing this whole show just on him. And the effect he has, not only in the show, but on general life lessons you can pick up that are amazingly profound. My favorite character. Oh, yeah. Like, Iroh is one of the best characters in that show. For the that kind of world-weary, yet still optimistic guy like he's old he's seen a lot of shit he's been through a lot of shit he has lost a lot of shit i mean he's a war weary general a war hero until his great defeat he was a legendary figure a powerful person well respected and even revered next in line for the throne at one point Mm -hmm. but he lost it all he lost his son he lost his war he lost his status but when we come in on him on the show... When we come in on him at the beginning of the show, right, mm-hmm. we're seeing him with Zuko, you know, the exiled prince. And we really, when we're first introduced to him, he seems pretty lackadaisical in comparison to Zuko's hot-headedness and high-strung attitude. His whole stick is just, calm down, have some tea. Or eat this duck, you know, like, chill out, relax, and he won't have any of it, of course. Zuko is Mr. Honor at this point, and I must find the Avatar. But we really sort of almost get this picture of Iroh as being kind of lazy, almost, or just comic relief in a sense. He's really downplayed to start. And even when he starts doing stuff, yeah, sure, he's kind of being cool, wait, but... Oh, why can't you shoot them down with something, you know, more fragrant? (laughs) Like, he's still sort of being jokey and comic relief style, but... Then you have those moments of where he's a badass. Oh, yeah. Like, when he catches General Zhao's... When he wins the Agni Kai, yeah. Mm -hmm. Zuko wins, and Commander Zhao at that point goes to attack, basically, when his back is turned, and after being defeated and being shown mercy... He goes to attack, and Iroh just, like, jumps in, catches the, his foot through the fire attack, and just a little shove, just what looks like barest effort from him, throws him across the whole arena. Like, much. let me flick you away. Yeah. And from there we start, and then he gets abducted at one point by some Earth Kingdom soldiers who happen to just run across him while he's taking a bath, you know? He's chilling in a hot spring. And they catch him. And the fact that there's not really any way you can safely uh, restrain him. You can't use metal because he makes it red hot immediately. He burns pe- He burnt one guy's hands by heating the metal when he went to adjust his cuffs. <clears throat> Attempted to escape. We see him be a badass in this fight while being bound up. Being resourceful and yes. thinking ahead when he's like dropping his sandal as a breadcrumb for uh, Zuko. Because he knows Zuko will be looking for him. Mm -hmm. So he leaves his sandal, knowing that that would lead him in the right direction. But as we go through the first season, we see his character shift from just being this sort of lackadaisical caretaker to someone who's really trying to help Zuko, like gives a real shit about this guy, and is sort of being whatever Zuko needs him to be, which at the time was sort of his... You know, the yin to Zuko's overbearing and fiery yang. He was trying to be the calm and suppressive element. But once they found the Avatar, you can sort of tell that Iroh had to make some choices as they were going along. How much was he going to help Zuko actually hunt the Avatar? Even though you can get this impression from him that he's not really believing they should do that. He actually kind of seems to think the Avatar is important and stuff. And by the end of the first season, you see that when real tension is put on his loyalties, they end up being with Zuko instead of the overall Fire Nation. 
Oh, yeah. He sides with the spirits over Zhao at the end of the first season. He fights his own people over protecting the spirits. I mean, he does state, you know, that it would hurt even the Fire Nation to destroy the moon, and he's right. But still, he goes directly to fight his own people in what is technically a military-sanctioned action. The killing of that spirit was by the decree of the commander in a lawful order. He disobeyed it to protect a spirit and protect the balance of the world, which sort of tells you his allegiance is not to the Fire Lord propaganda, but to the world and to Zuko. You see that actually earlier, I, you know, that scene where Zuko is about to sneak off the uh, ship in order to catch the Avatar on his own, using that invasion as a distraction. And there's that pivotal little conversation between Zuko and Iroh. I don't need your wisdom right now, Uncle. I'm sorry. I just nag you because, well, ever since I lost my son... Uncle, you don't have to say it. I think of you as my own. But season two rolls around. The invasion fails. Zuko doesn't catch the Avatar. All that. And we see them quickly put on the run by Azula, Zuko's sister. And this leads us to see a different more powerful side of Iroh. Because Zuko is now no longer sure of himself, sure of his destiny. He's weak and vulnerable in a way. And this is where we see the protective Iroh. We see the strong Iroh show up. Well, we see the Iroh who... It's really interesting the type of strength that he shows that you don't really recognize as such, which is simply... It's simple pride in oneself. Well, first, it's the strength of acceptance. Right. Before, you know, you're right entirely. Don't get me wrong. But before that, I think, is the strength to simply accept the situation as it is. Well, that's what I mean is it's that basic humility. <clears throat> yes. Right? Where Zuko's raging against this situation because they're now traitors. They're now hunted. And he's angry and he wants to fight back. Iroh is like, you know, we can't really f effectively fight back against this right now. Our best play is to live as refugees, so that's just what we should do. I'm not going to fight against something I can't fight against. I'm going to learn to just... Actually, he doesn't even have to learn to. He just falls into the role of being a refugee now. A humble, simple man. Because really, and as point you can pick up from it, he was humbled by his defeats and his losses. He was made to be a different man by his suffering. He recognizes that the water continues to flow down the river. Yes. And this too shall pass. And it changed him. And you really see that in season two when they're living as refugees, beggars. Like the scene where they're begging for coin in an earth kingdom. Guy I'm... rolls up on them like, How about some entertainment in exchange for a gold piece? We're not performers. Not professional anyway. You know, and start swinging swords at them to get... Like, you gotta actually dance while you're singing for me and performing. But he throws him a gold coin at the end of it. <laughs> Nothing like a fat man dancing for his dinner. Here you go. Such a kind man. And there's that moment there where... Iroh's pride is so much more powerful than that man's stupid little attempt to humiliate him. And Zuko is, he's the one at the end of the episode who has to beat the guy up and steal his swords and continues to use them throughout the show. Yeah, he can't, he's humiliated, he's angered. But Iroh is beyond that. His pride is untouched by that. Oh, he, he made me sing and dance a little. He gave us the money. He gave me a gold coin for that. And I got to sing and dance. I was in no real danger. I'm a fucking badass. What do I care? Like, that did not in any way actually harm him. He was up being a humble man. What, what does singing for his supper and performing for a few moments to get that gold coin really matter in the grand scheme of things? And what was he spending most of the time doing anyway? He was complimenting strangers, passersby yeah. and stuff, and making their day better, and then also getting paid for it. Yeah. The coin is appreciated, but not as much as your smile. <laughs> Just passing along kindness. And then we see, of course, 
things hit a peak when Zuko finds Appa, mm -hmm. where they've had this dichotomy going back and forth. They separate for a while, come back together. They're trying to sort of make sense of each other and come to terms with things. And it looks like it happened eventually, because when they find Appa, they have this important conversation where Ira basically makes Zuko confront himself. I wonder who could be behind that mask. <sighs> what are you doing here? I was just about to ask you the same thing. What do you plan to do now that you've found the Avatar's bison? Keep it locked in our new apartment? Should I go put on a pot of tea for him? First I have to get it out of here. And then what? You never think these things through. This is exactly what happened when you captured the Avatar at the North Pole. You had him, and then you had nowhere to go. I would have figured something out. No! If his friends hadn't found you, you would have frozen to death. <sighs> I know my own destiny, Uncle. Is it your own destiny? Or is it a destiny someone else has tried to force on you? Stop it, Uncle. I have to do this. I'm begging you, Prince Zuko. It's time for you to look inward and begin asking yourself the big questions. Who are you? And what do you want? Ah! So basically, we see that Iroh is trying to change Zuko because Zuko's being headstrong. He's being wrong. He's believing in things that were put in his mind by other people. Iroh is trying to force Zuko to discover himself in that moment. Who are you? As he says, you know, what do you want? It's that push where he's saying, you could do this thing, but it's stupid, it's wrong, and it's for no real reason. Or you could choose your own fate and become something different. And Zuko keeps having these, what you can think of, like these melodramatic teenage moments, like throwing down his swords and yelling up at the sky. You've always thrown everything you could at me. Well, I can take it. And now I can give it back! Come on! Strike me! You've never held back before! Ah! I mean, he's having to question the worldview he's had and the way he's lived his entire life. Yes. And not only that, but he is a melodramatic teenager, literally. That's his age point. And he's gone through some shit. People sort of make fun of what he's doing there. But at the same time, he's a hot-headed, emotional teenager that has been wronged severely and repeatedly and, well, has pretty good reason to be a little emotionally unstable. Well, yeah, I mean, again, the way that... The kind of privilege that he's been raised in and the situations that he's going through and stuff. Right. I mean, every, then, every part of his character is completely justified. Yes. Even if, you know, overwrought and melodramatic. Don't tell me people aren't like that, though. <laughs> yeah. But the point is, Iroh, you can tell. he At this point, he's laid on the wisdom. He's laid on the understanding, that world-weary, yet still optimistic view of, I've seen shit and I know what it's like to operate under a destiny that's not really mine. You know, once Zuko and then become outcast and everything, it's like he sees it finally, that opportunity. Now Zuko's questioning that formerly fervent belief in his destiny. And it's like Iroh sees that as that moment. Now I can help him. Oh, by the way, uh, toxic masculinity. Yes. Parallels. Oh, yeah. That's all there. Yeah. The way the Fire Lord runs things, all of that. Look at the damage it does to Azula. But that's a different note. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but basically, when Zuko releases Appa, it's because Iroh reached him. And you can see that in that next episode where he has the weird dreams and everything and then comes out of it trying to be this better person and sort of let go of those problems he had. That, But it's really only superficial is the issue because, because as soon as you put tension on it, it snaps because at the crossroads of destiny, Zuko's laid a choice between joining the Avatar and doing the right thing. Or joining his sister Azula and helping overthrow the Earth Kingdom and capture the Avatar and bring darkness to the world, basically. And he chooses Azula and his father over his uncle and the right thing to do. He makes the wrong choice. And this prompts Iroh to do what? Betray his nation and protect the Avatar. 
Although it's hard to say he becomes a traitor when he saves the only thing that can save the world. He's a traitor to his nation and a hero to all living people. <laughs> <laughs> so there's that moment there where he's thrown into the fire, right? Zuko has made this choice. The person he cares about has chosen evil. And what does he do? He makes a stand. He throws away basically everything to protect the Avatar because it's the right thing to do. Even after everything he had done, all that effort he had spent on Zuko and everything, he threw it all basically away on on the fact that protecting the Avatar was the right thing to do. His people were wrong. They needed to be stopped. But this takes us to season three, right? Where we get to see Iroh be the best guy ever. Truly self-sufficient. Because he's in jail. And the whole time... This is where we see Iroh's cunning, the intellect that made him the dragon of the West, basically, as a, a feared general, where he plays up his, the, this reputation he had gained of being a slob and being lazy and insane and sort of tricks the guards mostly into thinking of him as being worthless. The whole time he's secretly like super training because, well, he's fucking prison. What else is he going to do? And he has a plan. A very long game, actually, where he's training and training and training. And also, by the way, finding time to get messages snuck to Zuko to try to still help him and lead him to a different answer. The whole time, even after all that, we see this repeatedly in Season 3, Iroh still trying to save Zuko, sending him messages, getting him to try to learn about his past, his family's past, to see how wrong they are, pushing him every step of the way, even while in jail, even after being rejected and betrayed by him. And he's still the kind of person who, even after everything he's been through, what does he do to the guard who normally comes by before he makes his break? Oh, the one nice guard? Thank you, Ming. Your little gestures of kindness have made my days in prison bearable. I think you should take the rest of the day off. What? You don't look well. Maybe you should go home and rest. No, I feel fine. Trust me, it is better that you are not here this afternoon. <laughs> and she looks a little scared and leaves. <laughs> because what does he do? Because he plans it all this in preparation for the day of Black Sun, the eclipse so that he can bust himself out, as to use the guard's quote. He busted himself out. I've never seen anything like it. He was like a one-man army. Kazuka goes to rescue him. Because at this point, all of Iroh's lessons, plus being exposed to the people that he supposedly loved and wanted to be with, actually getting to see who they were, disgusted him. It made him feel like he was wrong. And because of Iroh's pushing, his lessons, they finally sunk in. Zuko turned on his evil family and decided to go with Iroh. But by the time Zuko goes to bust him out, Iroh's long gone and has torn the prison a new asshole by himself. <laughs> That's the other thing we learn about Iroh. He was just being retired, basically. He was still a badass the whole time, and he spent that effort reclaiming what he once was, which was apparently an elite badass of super-powered proportions. Because... Yeah, after that, we see a very different Iroh. We don't see him for a while, but when we do see him again, after Zuko's chosen the right path, worked with Team Avatar for a good while, right? I, that scene where they re-meet after Zuko's betrayal and after all of that. Uncle, I know you must have mixed feelings about seeing me, but I want you to know I am so, so sorry, Uncle. I am so sorry and ashamed of what I did. I don't know how I can ever make it up to you, but I... How can you forgive me so easily? I thought you would be furious with me. I was never angry with you. I was sad because I was afraid you lost your way. I did lose my way. You found it again. And you did it by yourself. And I am so happy you found your way here. It wasn't that hard, Uncle. 
You have a pretty strong scent. It really goes back to the unconditional love of a parent that you kind of see displayed first when on the ship at the end of season one, when he just keeps saying, Remember your breath of fire. It could save your life out there. I will. And put your hood up. Keep your ears warm. I'll be fine. And you see it never waver the entire three seasons. It never wavers. That unconditional love. Not once. He never once is actually f like wanting to be mad at Zuko for all the bullshit he puts him through. He's sad. He's upset. He's disappointed. He gets frustrated with oh, how yeah. stubborn as fuck he is. Yeah. He gets mad sometimes. But he's not really angry. Not, not in that way. I care about you. If his friends hadn't found you, you would have frozen to death. But you see it from this person that, oh yes, and to culminate this, we really get some extra insight into his character through, you know, the tales of Iroh. Before the end of season three, when they're in Ba Sing Se, we get a little Tales of episode, which is basically get little snippets of every character's sort of daily random life in Ba Sing Se, because they're all living there. At one point, Iroh, like, I love the bit with the kids where they're uh, playing with the ball, they hit it through someone's window, and immediately Iroh's like, It is usually best to admit mistakes when they occur, and to seek to restore honor. But that's immediately undercutting the situation when the dude's an asshole. But the one that's really a good demonstration of his character is the guy who tries to steal from him. <laughs> the mugger? Uh-huh. Yeah. Where he, the first thing he says to him. What are you doing? I'm mugging you. With that stance? What? What are you talking about? Just give me your money, old man. With a poor stance, you are unbalanced and you can be easily knocked over. And it and sums up his character right there where he just. With a solid stance, you are a much more serious threat. Much better. But to tell you the truth, you do not look like the criminal type. I know. I'm... I'm just confused. So you really think I could be a good masseur? Of course. This is so great. No one has ever believed in me. While it is always best to believe in oneself, a little help from others can be a great blessing. And then at the end of this scene, Right? When he set up his little picnic at the base of a tree with lit incense, and he's crying over that picture of his son, just... Happy birthday, my son. If only I could have helped you. And this relates really well to uh, how Iroh's character is further built on in Korra, like when she goes to the spirit world. Yes. What's pivotal to his character is this little bit he says right here. Sometimes the best way to solve your own problems is to help someone else. Where, if you look at that and look at his character through all three seasons of Avatar, right? You see that he couldn't save his son. He couldn't save the people that he wanted to save. He couldn't do a lot of what he wanted to do. So, he can't help himself. So what does he do? He spends his life helping other people. You see this in everything he does, from how he helps Zuko, how he helps Avatar, how he helps the Avatar, how he helps Toph randomly, just meets her. She birth bends at him, and he ends up giving her very helpful advice over tea. He doesn't even know who the fuck she is, but ends up helping her. He ends up building a useful alliance later on. Yes. Just because he wanted to have, you know, Having tea with strangers is one of life's greatest pleasures. And he ends up helping her overcome an issue with her being unable to work with her teammates. His advice helps Toph become an integrated part of Team Avatar. He's an object lesson in the kindness of strangers and our interdependence with other people as a social species. He's, yes. Oh, he's so great. He's and so great. Here's the other thing, right? Compare him to other 
wise figures from media. A lot of these pithy, one-line shooting, you know, so-called wise people. I'm looking at you, Yoda. Especially, you know, Empire Strikes Back, Yoda. There is no try. Yeah, do or do not. There is no try. And it was just like, wait a minute. No, no. To do anything, you have to try to do it. Yoda's advice made perfect sense in context by the end when it was like, I don't believe it. That is why you failed. Right. But at the same time, where is he going to get that belief from other than experience? Yoda's a great example of this general thing that a lot of the different movie and show and media wise people do. Look at like Gandalf. Look at fucking Dumbledore. Look at these people where they just sort of give cryptic like advice. They sort of give this interpretable, nigh unto prophecy like advice that is only truly relevant in hindsight half the time. Looking at you. Dumbledore. The thing that I noticed when I was watching back through the show recently was how almost every single scene with him has a lesson in it. Even when they're down on their luck, they then get into a great position with the... The Jasmine Dragon. Yeah, the tea house. Yeah. And the very first, the opening scene with it, where Iroh says that... Who thought when we came to this city as refugees that I'd end up owning my own tea shop. Follow your passion, Zuko, and life will reward you. Congratulations, Uncle. I'm very thankful. You deserve it. The Jasmine Dragon will be the best tea shop in the city. No, I'm thankful because you decided to share this special day with me. It means more than you know basically gives the same Captain Obvious lesson that you have in the past, that success requires effort. Yes. Where the guy is trying to run the tea shop without really putting any effort into it. And he's like, you have to put love into this, you know? This is just, you know, hot leaf juice, basically. That's what he says when he first drinks it, yeah. yeah. Spits it back out. And, and he goes like, isn't that all tea? And he's like, I can't believe someone who said that is related to me. <laughs> but... No, there's that point there, right? Where Iroh's lessons aren't just put there and sort of like given to you with pithy one-liners and simple like philosophical sounding words. They're explained to you, given practical meaning. Not only is he saying, you know, do this and this, but often is he giving reasons for it or some kind of parable, you know, when he's talking to Aang about choosing cosmic power or love when they're going through the cave to rescue Zuko. Well, I met with this guru who was supposed to help me master the Avatar state and control this great power. But to do it, I had to let go of someone I love. And I just couldn't. Perfection and power are overrated. I think you are very wise to choose happiness and love. What happens if we can't save everyone and beat Azula? Without the Avatar State, what if I'm not powerful enough? I don't know the answer. Sometimes life is like this dark tunnel. You can't always see the light at the end of the tunnel. But if you just keep moving... You will come to a better place. Even with that advice, right? You have Iroh giving a lesson about life is unpredictable and uncertain. But using the metaphor of the cave around him as they're traveling through it, not only are you getting this lesson about, you know, life has darkness and uncertainty, but that if you just trudge forward and keep trying and keep moving, you will often find you come to a better place, right? He shows you lessons rather than just tells you. There's an important thing. You want to really make an audience absorb something? Show, not tell. Make them believe it by letting them see it happen. If they intro the character by doing something badass or saying something wise or making something happen, we'll believe it because they're showing it to us. And every step of the way with Iroh, he shows us the impact of what he's saying, the meaning of it. He has lived it, and they let you know that. So even the points where he's just telling the lesson, it's often coming after a point where they have established that he has lived that lesson, that he has gone through the failure of not listening to that lesson, so he can speak with authority on it. And many times does he simply convey his lessons with an earnest passion that a lot of the other 
wise men sort of miss, where they're sort of sagacious with it and standing high and like detached when they give their advice, sort of like I am giving you this dispassionate wisdom, where he is often passionately proclaiming these things, especially with Zuko, where he is confident in what he's saying, but more than that, he is earnest about it, how this you need to listen to these things because they could help you. That ultimate point is he's teaching from that position of wanting to help people, which makes his lessons valuable because he has been through, you could say, the other side of the coin as a ruthless general, right? I think as one final piece of a lesson, right, to draw from Iroh's example as a character altogether, is that he was once the dragon of the West, right, a feared general. And in the flashbacks, he, he was sending letters during the siege joking about if we don't burn it to the ground. So you could tell that he's a different person. And he even says, you know, when someone asks him at one point, have you been here before? His response is once, when I was a very different man. And someone like that, has transformed so completely into a different person, has become more whole, more wise, more content with life than ever before, and has completely changed. You can see that really anyone is capable of great change, becoming wise, becoming strong, and not in the physical strength way, but in that character strength. And he did it through suffering and loss. But in a way, you can tell he's trying to impart these lessons on other people so that they don't have to go through that suffering and loss to learn them. And I think that becomes really one of the most important statements about him, if I'm going to close on anything. It's that he is somebody who has been empowered by suffering and loss with great wisdom. And he wants to share that wisdom with people, especially the people he cares about, so that they don't have to go through the same things he did in order to learn them. He can spare them the pain. When we see many other villains, right? You know, they're all portrayed as understandable figures and such. But this is a character who was a villain from that traditional Avatar standpoint. But we see the results of their change, their transformation from being a villain into a hero, into a good person. Because this could have been, you know... In earlier days, this could have been another Admiral Zhao type villain or something. This could have been, you know, someone that the Avatar would have had to have fought and would have had to have considered a worthy opponent. But since he's already had that defeat and that wisdom, we see the results of how these villains could change. He is our example of what they could become if given a chance. And I think that might be the best of all points to close on. That even villains, even people we consider to be bad people, right? If given a chance, if given the chance to learn, and they do learn, if given the willingness to learn, of course, they can become better people, and in fact become some of the best people because of what they once were.